machine learning. Machine learning and yes. all kinds of exciting things. So physics and more neural networks. Yeah. Yeah. Hot topic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you everyone for coming in. So today we are going to talk about uh, the physical form neural network. It is just a scientific machine learning technique that is used to solve some PD problem. So from the previous talk, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, people. I mean, using uh, solving some uh, PD related problem uh, using the classical uh, methods such as uh, finite difference, finite elements, discontinuous directed method. So I hope uh, after the talk, uh, can motivate them to try on the scientific <laughs> machine learning techniques as well. So uh, uh, I'm going to use the board and uh, if we need to solve now in what I'm going to talk about today, since we are going to solve a problem that involves some technique, I will start by uh, uh, classifying those problems in three different categories. And uh, we quickly give a, a brief introduction to the deep learning, uh, deep neural networks. Then I will uh, motivate the use of uh, the scientific machine learning methods. Then uh, the main part, which will be how we use the pin to solve those kind of uh, problems. And uh, hopefully, I will have some demo to show some of uh, the implementation to demonstrate how easy it's, it is to be used. And uh, we end uh, with uh, some of the challenges that we have uh, in uh, using the PID to solve those kind of problems. So PDs uh, that involve uh, problems that involve PDs can be classified in three different categories. So different. So the first one will be the power uh, simulation. So the power simulations, what does it mean? You have a problem that involves the PTE. You know all the hyperparameters of your problem, and uh, you just want to simulate the, simulate the solution of your PTE. So as an example, let's say we have an somewhere uh, in a certain location. And uh, knowing uh, the field of uh, the velocity, let me call it this C, X, Y. So this is the velocity. And then know uh, the location of uh, the source of the earthquake. So uh, let's see. X zero, Y zero of uh, so the location. I know the location of the source. Then I want to evaluate uh, what is uh, the wave field. Uh, it is on U that depends on the time uh, and on the space. Okay. So I know only half a parameter of my equation. And I want to evaluate the solution. So that's the forward problem. The other category would be the inverse simulation. Inverse simulation. So inverse simulation, that is just the reverse of this one. So in this case, I know I can measure some of the wave of field. the U, X, uh, Y, T, and I would like to know what are the happen parameter for my equation, is X, Y, and the location, X, zero, Y, zero. And the third one will be the discovery equation. Discovery simulation. I know the, the, the web uh, field, I know the hyper parameters. Uh, 
is T X Y and the location X zero, the Y zero. And what I would like to know is uh, what is uh, the equation that uh, govern the problems. So with equation, in this case, uh, the T vector zero, one of C, so this will be the three category when it comes to solving a problem uh, that involve some PD. And uh, to solve, especially the first two, we have some uh, classical method that we can use. The second one, the inverse simulation one, we can uh, mathematically rewrite it as a sum of PD constraints. Constraint optimization problem. So, whatever I want to solve, either the first or the second one, I will probably need to solve some PDs. And uh, the classical method that we have, uh, for example, Classical method. We have the finite difference method, uh, the finite element method, uh, the finite volume method. We have the discontinuous symbolic method, and so on and so forth. Stay track of it. Okay. So these are the methods that we can uh, use classically to solve uh, the PD itself. Yes. In the first two is F now or unknown. The F, uh, the function, the source. Yeah. Uh, the first two, we assume that in uh, this case, we can assume that it is known, the forward. The forward problem, we can assume that it is known. And the first, uh, we can either try to Okay, to see, okay, either we want not only the velocity and uh, the location of uh, the source, but uh, maybe we can think also to get as other functional as well. Okay, and in the bottom one, the F's unknown? In the bottom one, all we know is uh, this three quantity here, and uh, we want to be able to come up with uh, the, point, the equation that's satisfied this and uh, govern our Problem. So the equation doesn't have that one necessarily? Not necessarily. Okay. But uh, since the problem is uh, uh, some, uh, uh, we are trying to model the earthquake, so we can assume that okay, the equation will come back to the wave equation. Okay. So classical methods. Most of the time, uh, when we are using the classical methods, we usually come up with uh, some families. Well, some of you are using this method. So what is uh, the challenge is that we have most of the time? Well, the challenge is the large. So we can have some large system. Uh, system. So later, uh, I put everything here together as a uh, some complex system, complex system. So complex system in the complex system, we can put up the, the multi scale, the multi physics. We can even put up the, the complex geometry of which we are solving the problem. And uh, yeah, what else do we have? Sometimes we don't, most of the time when it comes to some real life problem, no exact solution. So we don't have the exact solution, but we always apply the numerical methods and come up with some numerical solutions. And uh, sometimes we have some tricks uh, to validate okay, if it is correct or not. Most of the time uh, we can look at uh, the 
convergence, just to make sure that this uh, the solution is not stable enough. Or uh, we can look at uh, the behavior of the solution, like the brand towards the last name. The water that is supposed to flow out uh, through some uh, small uh, uh, hole is uh, supposed to be circular. So we can make use of those behavior to say, okay, this can be a big closer to return. And uh, uh, we can also have uh, some uh, real data problem. Real data problem. So by real data problem, if you don't have some major solution, you can go to the lab and try to simulate the problem. The, the payment and try to come up uh, to see if uh, the other solution that we are getting at least uh, is satisfying the lab uh, solution at some uh, points. But the problem with this is that this can be quite uh, sparse and uh, we definitely contain uh, some noises. And even if we go ahead and do this, um, there is no way we can uh, also try to, because every time we come up with the numerical solution before, go in here. Okay. So, now the question is, can we avoid uh, this by finding uh, a function instead of that will uh, satisfy our equation when it comes to solving uh, the PT? Can we find a okay. Make function that we know the expression of that function. Such a way that still we know the expression of the function is that uh, we can go ahead and double check uh, if uh, that function satisfy uh, our equation. If we do have uh, some uh, data, even if it is sparse, we like to see if uh, the function that we have uh, found, which is the approximation of our function, at least uh, get close to this. Area. That's why in the, the scientific machine learning techniques, uh, one of the methods that we are going to use, function that we are going to use, is uh, the deep neural network. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to the deep neural network. I don't know if everybody is familiar with that, so I can skip it. Can we give me a <laughs> So the deep neural network uh, is just a mimic of uh, what's happening in uh, the body of a uh, human. Uh, uh, by that we mean like uh, if I'm making the movement that comes from the signal that is sent from one neuron to the other, and there is uh, some computation going on behind it that quantify what would be the action when uh, we input them some electric, electrical field uh, through some neuron. So it's just the same mimic. So it's just a function that goes from some inputs there. Take some inputs and come up with uh, some uh, outputs. Yeah. And in between here, we have what we call uh, the hidden. Uh, yeah. And if I call this the initial A, because this one is one, then between I have us some hidden there that has several neurons as well. If I call the neurons, that's so the way it works, I want to compute the element here, that will be come from a contribution of each neuron here. The second one also will be some contribution of each of these neurons. Yeah, this one here, this one here, and so on and so forth. And uh, mathematically, you can remember this 
the screen that the well, he wants up to some end up. The complete sum of it here. That will be some linear combination plus some size WK H K minus one. So this is a uh, linear contribution that gives me the value at this level, but the value itself uh, must go through some uh, activation, what we call the activation. A K. And this will be my H P. And I repeat this until uh, the last neuron when it becomes L plus one. Then uh, it will be L plus one is going to be L plus two. That's on W L plus one. Uh, H L plus one L plus one. And then I have the H L plus one. It is based on again a station of uh, this A L plus one. So this is how the deep network function is defined. And as you can see, it's a nonlinear function. And thanks to the fundamental work of a uh, mathematician that is called uh, Stipenko. He has proven that uh, if we take a function that is continuous in uh, some uh, uh, subset uh, that is compact, it has to be to a B. Then uh, we can always find uh, <laughs> One of our deep deep neural network that will be an approximation of uh, this function. So basically, the space of uh, deep deep neural network uh, will be tensor uh, in uh, side this space. So basically, this can be a good approximation of uh, any function that is continuous. That is a solution of our. So since uh, the neural deep neural network can be a good approximation. How can we use the deep neural network function now to approximate the solution of the, the PT? So one way of uh, doing this is uh, just by making use of uh, the data, like uh, the data scientist uh, will uh, say. In this case, I have this as known, this as unknown, and I want to figure out uh, this value using uh, some function. So what I can do, I can generate uh, a lot of amount of uh, this data here, a lot of amount of this data, and then map up this using uh, the neural, deep neural network. Similarly, I can do the same thing here. I can do the same thing here. So if I naively use the so request approach, First approach. I want to make use of uh, the data on Make use of the uh, data on So we go ahead, uh, we use the classical methods to generate uh, the input, the output. And then we map the inputs we have put uh, using the deep neural network. So that can be a way of uh, answering uh, the question, our initial question, which is to solve uh, a problem that's involved in the DT. But the challenge with uh, this approach is the fact that if you look at uh, the neural network expressions, we have here what we call uh, the weights of uh, our neural network, which are these constant weights. So if I came up with uh, those weights, what will be the meaning of uh, the weights set? So the challenge with this method, the first one is uh, the interpretability. The 
availability of. Uh, yes. What are those five uh, functions? This function, I call it the activation function. Yeah, uh, some of the software can be the usually use the hyperbolic function, the single function, the distributed function. So, how about cases where they don't have data everywhere? I don't have data everywhere. Yes, okay. since you're generating, you want to map them. So, what do we do in this? Exactly. So, that is one of our second challenge, which we call the linearization. So, we don't have the data everywhere. We have the data in some location. It means that the transmission will be good there. And if you want to generalize it to the other part, then the you might have some uh, sorry. I have some so that's the one that we call us the generalization problem. Okay. And that the third problem at, uh, usually is uh, the amount of data. The amount of data, you need a lot of data to be able to have something that is accurate. Okay. So this is it. So I mean the the input space is infinite. The input space? Yeah, but no for the for the VE. Okay. For the VE. Yeah, so like what is the input layer then? It's like it would be like a yes. solution or some value of the discrete point or the domain or like even with C, for example, mm -hmm. the velocity. Yeah. yeah. At some fixed point over the domain, not like C, you know, because you don't, you can't put every value of C as a function, right? It's like yes. so values. Discrete values, yeah. So for example, okay, if I want to generate this type of data, yeah, I can fix this, use all of this method to come up with the D. Mm -hmm. So that is one input. Mm -hmm. So the whole field is just one input. Okay. And then uh, I will generate uh, multiple. Mm -hmm. Input and outputs. Then we use those input outputs up mm -hmm. to train them okay. by deep learning. So you should think about like there's an underlying grid or some of the techniques we use on the solve problem. Yeah. And you have that values at those whatever points. And Point that that's it. Yeah. 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 And you have to use the same grid every time. Yes. Okay. So we have this problem with uh, this approach using the data only. So the solution to these challenges will be the combination of uh, so the solution will be the combination of uh, not only the data but also the scientific knowledge or the physics. Yes. Um, so if for my not only the data, I don't have a, a lot of data, it's very costly to obtain. Then I will assume that uh, since my data is not that much, then uh, the scientific notation of force in the training will compensate the data that I'm using. And that will solve also the generalization problem because I have the data is some one location, if I can fit it in that location and make sure that the physics also is satisfied, then it means that we can be a standard house of the data in the And in terms of the, it will solve also the interpretability problem. Like for example, if in our physics, we have some uh, upper parameter that we can rest for, but at least the upper parameter we have some meaning because of the physics. And uh, this is what we call uh, the scientific machinery. And uh, we have multiple type of uh, scientific machinery techniques, and uh, the one that we are going to talk about today we did a physics and formal neural network. So I'm going to clean up this function. Yeah. 
That's it works now. So before we talk about how it's work, I'd like to mention that uh, one of the uh, famous article when it comes to things appeared in 2019. It has been published by a mathematician called um, Ice. Ice. 2019. In the 2018, that was in 2019, and in 2018, it has been cited 30 times. And from 2000, I believe, 2019 to 2020, uh, the number of articles that mention the themes as uh, 24. So the rate of uh, people looking into this method is increasing exponentially because it's even a vote record. So, how does it work? Let's talk about the let's set up a program first. That we are so mathematically. So program that we are solving mathematically is a um, PD. So let's say it is some uh, differential uh, equation uh, that is applied to we call it the U. That depends on uh, the time and the x, which will be some function of the uh, time x. And uh, this is for x on some uh, omega that is in the and for the set that include the x of r equal to u and the t, and it's just one dimension. So this is our PD. We have, uh, we might have the boundary condition. I'm just going to write it as some uh, differential operator as well as DC. It is just some uh, upper parameter, U, E, X, according to some H, T, S. Well, the X now is going to be on the uh, no, so uh, 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 our domain uh, on the T is going to be on uh, zero time. And we might have uh, some initial condition as well. And I'm going to write some T uh, I T U X, which is a function of the X. Uh, and the answer is uh, everywhere in our idea. So for the problem uh, that involves the PD, as we have mentioned here, there is a combination of uh, the data and the uh, scientific understanding. Scientific understanding can be the combination of uh, this. This is a little bit three at once. Then we can uh, some problem. Maybe for some problem, I'm able to know exactly what the PD is, but I can define the boundary condition. So I will be hoping that it will be captured by the data, and so on and so forth. So let's consider this three first. Is that a subscript? Okay, the boundary is there. Okay, the boundary. What's the subscript on the differential operator? Yeah, DC. Just to remember. Oh, DC. Okay. Okay. So let's start with the DC. Uh, So in order to solve this using uh, the pins, so how does the pins work now? I want to apply the pins to this. As we mentioned, we want to approximate this solution using uh, a neural network. So it's gonna take uh, the X is uh, in RD. So let me put a sum. Uh, so it's supposed to be, let me, let me use this. I'm going to use this 
for the t, and then we use the square for the x. The square can be multiple neurons, depending on the dimension of uh, our omega m. So this we go to our neural networks. So the neural network we depend on our some uh, some equation theta, which are the weights on uh, each a link between the neuron and the lines all together combined. And uh, this we output up, uh, we also use uh, the square u of theta. U of theta, depending on uh, the dimension of the u, this can be also some multiple variables as well as the square. So this is uh, our approximation. And thanks to the a very nice uh, computation uh, method, which is called the auto differentiation, automatic differentiation. I think uh, it's going to talk about it. Sorry. It's Anton. Anton, yes. I think it's going to talk about that. So thanks to the auto automatic uh, differentiation method, then I can go ahead of, since this is a neural network, can go ahead and compute all those uh, differential operators of uh, this function. The D, P, Q, theta, I computed the D, D, C, P of uh, the U, theta, I can also compute the D, I, U, theta. I can compute all this uh, using uh, the automatic uh, differentiation. Automatic differentiation. And uh, once I can compute uh, this, then I can go ahead uh, and compute uh, what I would call uh, the loss function. Can go ahead and compute the loss function. The first function I will call it uh, the L data. The L data is just uh, the error of approximation between uh, the minor network, estimated at uh, some uh, collocation point where I collected the data with respect uh, to the data that I collected. So I can write this as uh, one over N. Uh, so n data summation k from one to n data of uh, the norm two of uh, the new data estimated at uh, some sk keep it on that dk it's a bit dk sk minus uh, some u k So this is the data that I've collected at a certain location, k, sk. So I will take a n data point where I collected it, and this represents uh, the error of approximation between uh, my data and uh, my uh, neural network. I will have the loss, the residual on the PD, which I can also rewrite as uh, one over and uh, let me call it PD, summation K from one to N, PD of uh, what's the uh, difference? So that will be the DP estimate at the U theta of uh, PK SK uh, minus uh, the f of a dk So this is the residual of my PDE using uh, the U as uh, the approximation function of the U. So, so there are you using like find a different scheme or something to like estimate what the differential operator is doing? Yeah. In the, the LPDE, if you have to evaluate the derivative of the function, so that it's like so, so in the, the lost 
in the LOPD. So this uh, acts as some co-location point that I choose randomly on my domain. So I choose some co-location point randomly on the, the omega. And then I evaluate the integer on the P3 over those co-location points. I think it was auto differentiation. Yeah. Yes. So oh, auto differentiation, yeah. I get this one. Yeah, yeah, and then you evaluate that. Then point. I can evaluate this. Oh, okay. okay, okay. So I have the LPD. I can go ahead and compute also the loss of the boundary. That is one over uh, BC here. So let's show K one to N BC. Of uh, again, uh, the residual at the boundary. That will be the D BC E of uh, the U eta CK SK. And also the functions H, H, B, A, S, K, And uh, the last one will be the initial, the L, E, uh, which will be the one over the N, E, summation K from one to N, E, normal for U, theta, Ek sk minus ng at least uh, uh, to be sk divided by the square. So the differential, I can compute this uh, differential variables. Then I can evaluate this loss function. And uh, from here, I can have my total loss function. L, which will be a function of uh, my weights. Yeah. That we write uh, as, uh, let me put some regulation term here. Oh, lambda, there's a L in theta, plus uh, lambda uh, L in D, plus uh, lambda C from L C plus lambda I L I. So I now completed this loss function, which depends on the theta. And what I would like to have at the end is the theta that gives me the U theta such that this loss function is as small as possible. So that goes back to solving. The alpha of uh, this function. And uh, numerically, I can use that. Oops. I can use that to update the data, my data. So I can use this if I can complete the creation of this and uh, use uh, some uh, optimization uh, tools such as uh, Adams, uh, your point, uh, so on and so forth. Update the data and go back. Yeah, this come back, computer this through again uh, until uh, I get uh, the U theta that will be the arg mean of uh, local one. Sorry, local one. Yeah, uh, yes. So I was coming back to that. So this is going to be some uh, the arg mean. So what I'm interested in uh, is so the U. Uh, can be transmit by some new data uh, where the data is going to be the under mean of uh, L data. So I start with some under, use some numerical optimization program to get the data. But uh, this function here, it is uh, non convex, it is non linear. So finding out. Uh, the optimal value of this is the end as well. Yes. So computational cost of this. So we are trying to compare, let's say you want to compare this with the classic one, right? So the classic one when you have the forward problem, you just discrepise. And then uh, you end up with uh, some uh, iteration, and then you have the solution. So that's 
straightforward. But uh, in this case, even if it is uh, a forward problem, uh, you still have to solve the optimization problem somewhat. And the good news about this is, as we mentioned, for the practical method, when, uh, uh, since you don't have uh, the exact solutions, it's hard to test if it is the correct one or not, other justification, that's what makes this better in terms of the forward problem. Then when it comes to the inverse problem, even if you are using the classical method, you are going to solve some optimization problem as well. So the cost, let me say, in the inverse problem, you is generally by bits the classical, but for the forward, it might be faster, but uh, due to the problem that we listed on the classical, this can be better sometimes. Especially when you have some instability, you know, uh, or problem of convergence, or the complex uh, geometry, you have a complex system, you can uh, apply the GT to some very complex uh, system uh, that you want to use uh, to analyze uh, some uh, phenomena. But uh, this one is quite easy because you have this, I can copy this easily, I can copy this one easily, so this is easy to implement, even if uh, the system is quite uh, complex compared to the classical one. So how do you do the time of life? How can I understand how you want to solve this for maybe one hour? Like your time you want to have the solution. Okay, you can look at the forward sense, right? I can certainly do this, I want to see the solution maybe one day after. Like how do you do that in the in how do I do this up in the like what I'm saying is that you for instance I take the four four problem point. And then that point will stand dependent. I can solve for the time. I said, okay, I want to solve this problem numerically. But not like in terms of days, like, like hours or seconds. I want to say so after 20 seconds. So how does that apply it? So this one, as you can see, when you are completing the last question here, it's based on uh, the collocation point, right? Mm -hmm. So when you are there, that's another problem for this. So when you are in a, a large scale problem, and then you pick uh, randomly this number of uh, location point. Okay. You might not cover the whole domain. I mean, so another way to deal with that problem is uh, in this case, people use uh, what is called uh, the sample plane method. So during the training, I sample first the collocation point that I use. I train uh, the neural network after some uh, iteration. Then I resample again the collocation point after I resample. I resample. So that helps uh, a lot uh, when it comes to the finding up, uh, approaching the global somehow, divisor here, yeah. and uh, to cover also the large scale. Uh, yes. All right, so the subject thing is the things to like real life work, right? Yes. Well, we have a lot of things to take into account. Let's say you're modeling a tsunami on the Pacific Ocean, right? And you have to keep resampling, and you don't know exactly the, the actual problem goes way there. How will uh, this be the classical method? So, if you are solving like a tsunami, you have, you have like a, your classical model. In this case, the reason that uh, if you look at uh, this, in real life, uh, you don't have the exact uh, model uh, to describe your phenomena. You might miss uh, some. Uh, we come back like uh, that's why we talk about uh, the complex, uh, um, the complex, the complexity of your system. Sometimes you make some assumption. Uh, I assume that okay, the velocity is so fast, so I forget about the distribution. Or oh, the uh, the velocity is so small, so I forget about uh, the transport and I focus on the diffusion. So those are the assumptions that you make use of in a real life when you want to use the classical method when it comes to the complex. You go for the complex to. And in this complex, making some assumption. But this one, the, since the complex, even for the complex, you can go ahead and compute this easily, then you, you don't necessarily need to take out of those complex uh, uh, phenomena that's happening in your system. So if I ask your question. Yes, um, I'm, I'm asking about a like how complex, like the cost, like costly. Costly. Yeah, yeah. How so in terms of the cost, that's what I'm saying, like uh, this, 
methods, don't back to solving a non convex non linear optimization problem. Okay, so it will be more, uh, it will take it will demand a more computational time when it comes to just using a classical method on a simple problem. When you have a simple problem that you want to solve, go ahead and use finite difference. But when you have a complex problem that you want to solve using uh, those uh, classical methods, sometimes it's not even doable. Like, the system is so complex that uh, if you want to, like in DD, I want to multiply by uh, the transfer quarter function, multiply by one function and then take the integral. So it's not possible to even discretize that complex problem. So in that case, uh, this uh, can be a good help. This approach can be a good help. If those problems can't be discretized, how does AutoCAD get it? How does, uh, because this is a neural network. So neural network, uh, for a neural network, I can easily compute this, uh, um, if, uh, if, uh, this operator here, which is a differential operator, because this is a neural network, I can compute this. Where we struggle, we probably with even for the complex, where we struggle with it here. Because the logs the function here will be even more complex. So the, the adagrad is itself parameterized by a neural network? The, 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 the automatic differentiation that, that itself is being parameterized by a neural network? Yeah, so as long as this is a neural network, then the also differentiation, it makes use of, I think, the, um, the chain ruler and some back propagation. You can make use of data to compute the differentiation of a disk function in the neural network. So I can compute the, like, uh, the first, second, or fourth derivative of this quite easy. Because this, when you look at the expression of like this function, u theta, it is a linear to apply it like activation function, linear activation function. Right, mu zero, you can, or mu theta, you can differentiate easily. I agree with that. But how do you compute like fancy b sub p if you can't discretize the underlying problem? No, I'm not using that. The, Classical discretization method to compute this up. To compute this up, you make use of uh, the chain rule, but the backward, because this function here, the u theta, let me write it as a uh, activation function of uh, some uh, linear, uh, of uh, some activation function, activation of uh, linear. It's, uh, and then this one uh, will become an X with some activation. And then I have uh, I have some linear multiple this, then activation function, and so on and so forth. Right. So this is your neural network, something like this. So if I'm going from the outputs to this direction, can make use of the channel ruler to compute the derivatives with respect to the weights here. Right, but how do you get derivatives with respect to x? The derivative with respect to x? Yeah, that uses the same uh, subtitle as well. Like a backward. But if, like, if the differential operator, like the, like the, the differential operator from the original problem, that was something that was like a poorly behaved differential operator, how do you, like, how would you compute something like that? No, like it's like in the variable, variable coefficient Poisson problem where the coefficient jumps, then you can't, like, technically. To compute the derivative in strong form, like it has a coefficient and it, it jumps. Equivalent. Yeah, so like you're doing like strong form, but many times people would just pose that in the weak form, where then the coefficient uh, like so variable Poisson problem, variable coefficient Poisson, so like divergence of uh, C, whatever, e, gradient mu equals F. And if, if that coefficient isn't differentiable, then you can't. Yeah, yeah, no, no, like the divergence. The divergence. Yeah, divergence of this is kind of what, like, yeah. Divergence of a term, but kind of like, oh, I'll just write it. <laughs> so it'd be like divergence of some coefficient, let's call it C of X times look times the gradient of uh, mu of X equals uh that. But if this thing isn't Technically differentiable, then you can't compute the loss 
Oh, okay. With with auto -grad. So in, in this case here, if I want to compute that this SPCP, yeah. all I need that is uh, because this is my neural network, right? Mm -hmm. So all I need that is to be able to evaluate that it's clicking. Mm -hmm. And uh, this clicking I can evaluate it uh, using uh, the auto differentiation area. Yeah. Then I can want to evaluate that this, mm -hmm. then I can come back and multiply by this. Mm -hmm. And I guess the divergence C is in the, like, you know. Is it continuous? Oh, the yeah. divergence? Yeah. Okay, okay, I see what it means. Yeah, yeah. It's like it works for strong form. Yeah. Like you're measuring errors in the strong form. Oh, but okay. many, I guess oh, in many cases it would be like weak form would be. Or even just a, any kind of PDE where a singularity might form. Yeah. Like mm. a shock or something. So yeah. this one, uh, I can't remember this somehow. <laughs> Let me write this as uh, yeah, you multiply by this, then I can change this to this might uh, have some uh, yeah, but I guess then C might not be differentiable. C might not, yes. So if C is not a differentiable, mm -hmm. so that's another issue. Yeah. I guess if you don't pick an XK, yeah, if you pick the XKs away from the discontinuity, then it doesn't matter. So can you point uh, yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> the but for shocks, I know there's a big issue. I know, no, a lot of this stuff, mm -hmm. I don't know. But you just, you just smooth those things out. You don't worry about it. Use the low order key. <laughs> don't worry about it. Add the fusion of this. Yeah, especially when you have the C. Your neural network smooth everything out. Mm. <laughs> it is sigmoidal functions or whatever. So the C, no functions here, where is it going? And uh, so in this case, what we can make it do is uh, uh, you can smooth this one out for the application and then uh, uh, probably use some uh, neural network approximation for, for this C as well. Mm -hmm. Then now the two things are getting work ready. Okay, so this is how the paint works in general. And uh, I'm going to quickly show. Do I have some time? Uh, maybe like five minutes. Maybe I should probably get out. It's out in time, five minutes. Oh, yeah. Then quickly. Yeah. I've never seen a class so excited into the room. I know. It's before the class starts. <laughs> it is kind of good. So to quickly show uh, the implementation of uh, the pins, how easy it can be in some cases. So I'm going to share this material. Uh, oops, I need to switch this one. Material that is uh, actual the work of uh, IC. So you go ahead and uh, apply this methodology to the burger equation. Can you see my screen? No? I need to. Is it If you lift up, I think it becomes a. Yeah. Okay. It's smoothed out on the hand. Okay. It's smoothed out. Oh, I missed it. Yeah, so There's a fusion in there. There's uh, equations there. So we're good. So the Berger equation, and yeah, so this is the Berger equation, and uh, it appears in uh, some various disciplines such as computer, uh, mechanics, and uh, gas uh, dynamics. It can be derived from uh, the nice stuff. So this is the question we consider. And uh, so from here, we can extract easily the uh, uh, differentiation operators. So how do I implement this? Uh, 
The first thing is uh, to import some of the package. So this was implemented in uh, tensor with the tensor flow two. So you generated the collocation point. Once you import the uh, the uh, the libraries, so this function is later on just to compute the the loss function. So you generated the collocation point. The n zero is for the uh, the initial, then be for the boundary, and this is for the uh, residual of in the inside the PD. And uh, we go ahead and generate this collocation. So this is the collocation point that we are going to use in this case here on the domain. So the red one will be for the residual, and the one at the top will be the boundary. The one on this side will be the initial collocation points. Then we initiated the uh, deep neural network. Once you initiate the deep neural network, uh, then uh, we need to compute uh, the loss function and the gradient of the loss function. So this is where you compute uh, the, you evaluate uh, the, what you call the, uh, differentiable uh, operators at uh, the collocation points. So as you can see, I just need uh, the collocation points. I take them, uh, evaluate uh, the model itself. Then I want to use this command. Uh, it's a uh, generator like uh, the derivative with respect to the x evaluate at uh, this collocation point. That's what I'm saying. So I can easily compute uh, the differential operators. And I can go ahead and uh, evaluate uh, the residual of the PD. I've defined this function above. The residual of the PD in this case is going to be, like you have seen here, it's going to be this operator minus uh, this product minus this one. And uh, once you compute uh, the residual in the PD, then the loss function, so here they added uh, the loss in the data, the boundaries as well. So everything they are doing here is just to add uh, the loss function in uh, the boundary, the initial, and um, the data as well. So we now have the loss function. How do we compute uh, the gradient of the loss function? You make use of, again, uh, the gradient tip uh, commands. And then uh, you now tip uh, the model train. Yeah, the model train, which is our theta then. So that will be the, then uh, if we take uh, the gradient tip of uh, the loss function with respect to the theta, then this will give us uh, the evaluation of uh, the loss function at the location point that is created. So we have the loss, we have its gradient. Then uh, we can uh, pass that uh, into some optimizer. So here we choose to use the Adam optimizer. So Adam optimizer, then uh, we go ahead uh, and uh, train this model for this number of times. So at each iteration, make use of the loss to update the, uh, the coefficients. And uh, with the printout here, like uh, the loss function, everything. So after 50, 5,000 uh, iteration, the loss function is given by this value, and this has been completed in a, so because we're worrying about uh, the computational time, so this is done in uh, less than uh, 200 seconds. And uh, this is uh, the error between uh, uh, the loss function, and uh, this is our solution. So, uh, I talk about uh, this method of uh, information when it comes to the inverse problem. So inverse problem, uh, let's assume that this parameter is uh, some constant. So if I want to, oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. But if you want to explain the parameter, you just move it up here. That's a trainable variable, and then you can estimate the parameter of uh, when it comes to the inverse problem. When it comes to the discovery, it's probably you have the U here. You assume that uh, your PD operator will depend on some uh, differentiable operators. 
And then you have another neural network that trainer like a function to evaluate it in detail. All right. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah.